On Tech News Today, IBM and Apple announce a huge partnership, Google reverses one of its most controversial policies for Google+, and Amazon is testing a new all-you-can-read service. We've got the details. All this and more coming up right now. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, July 16th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin. I'm joined by Jason Howell, of course, and our Wednesday co-anchor, Sarah Selbert from Engadget. Welcome, Sarah Silbert. Thank you. You brought a lot of news with you this morning. We've had a pretty dry series of days for the last few days, uh, kind of slow news days for the most part. But then you yeah, show Wednesday seems to be a good day. Yeah, you show up know, and look at, look at this. It's, it's incredible. Well, we better get into it because we have lots and lots of news and we have lots and lots of guests, three of them named Steve. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's true. Yeah, speaking of Steve, Steve Jobs must be turning over in his grave. Apple and longtime arch rival IBM announced a broad partnership yesterday to make Apple's iOS a bona fide enterprise platform and making IBM, of all things, a reseller of iPhones and iPads. Devendra Hardwar is a senior editor and the lead mobile writer for VentureBeat, and Maribel Lopez is the founder of Lopez Research, and she wrote about this story for Forbes. You're on the screen, so we'll start with you, Maribel. Can you tell us more about what IBM and Apple are planning to do together? Yeah, I think it originally came out as uh, Apple and IBM putting lots of apps onto phones, but really what they're trying to do is take uh, IBM's enterprise expertise, marry it with great Apple devices, and allow us to finally get good mobile enterprise apps on phones. And they're going to do that by uh, basically working closely with Apple and trying to make it so that developers can get all the management and security and all those icky enterprise features they need to work. Now, of course, Apple dominates uh, the uh, enterprise in terms of actual usage of, of phones. I believe that 73% uh, uh, of tablets uh, in use in U.S. corporations are iPads. 82% of smartphones uh, are iPhones. And that, I believe, is according to IDC. Why do they need bona fide enterprise applications uh, if, uh, if they're already so dominant? I mean, is that even necessary? So if you're asking me my opinion yeah, I am, on it, yes. Yeah, we have very few uh, real enterprise mobile apps. We're just at the very tip of the surface. And what we really need to do is create this next generation of enterprise mobile apps that are contextual, adaptive, dig deep into the device, are really meant to work on that device and not a PC. So I'd say we have very few of them today. And the other thing that I think is important is, you know, if you look globally, Samsung's starting to do a really good job and enterprises were starting to take notice. So I think Apple wants to basically secure its foothold in the North American market and also make sure that it doesn't lose out in the international space. And one way of doing that is to make sure that businesses can use their tools the most effectively. So does this lessen support by IBM for other platforms while this is all happening? Like, what about Android? Oh, can you take that, Devendra? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a uh, it's a really interesting question because Android right now uh, they, it has some sort of foothold in the enterprise. I think Samsung has done some really smart work there with their Knox security. Uh, but like everything with Android, the enterprise support is really fragmented. Um, so it's unclear what businesses will be doing in terms of enterprise. Um, I think for IBM, it doesn't make sense for them to give up on enterprise entirely, but it does make a lot of sense for them to focus on where those users actually are, and that's with iOS devices at this point. It'll be really interesting to see what uh, Google, Samsung, everybody does, and Microsoft, which has always been a strong enterprise uh, you know, company, but definitely not in mobile. Uh, this is sort of like the gauntlet being thrown down. Now, Devendra, uh, you know, uh, Apple uh, CEO Tim Cook uh, told a reporter that, quote, if you were building a puzzle, 
IBM and Apple would fit nicely together with no overlap. We don't compete on anything. Uh, and, you know, th this has always been the case. What is changed now? I mean, they've these two companies have been at each other's throughout. Apple's been very anti-IBM for, yeah. what, decades? <laughs> yeah. And suddenly they're the perfect partners. What what changed? It's kind of hilarious. I mean, there's a lot of history here. I don't know. It also, it makes me feel a little old because I'm aware of the, you know, 80s Apple versus IBM history. Uh, but the youngins today may not even understand what IBM used to do or what it used to mean to go against Apple. So what changed, I think, is the fact that, uh, you know, Apple now, maybe it's because of Tim Cook, because he's just a very pragmatic personality. But Apple now as a company is just doing things that are very pragmatic, uh, maybe not as far reaching and uh, visionary as people would like. But it makes sense because uh, I think Apple kind of uh, iOS devices got into businesses because they were the best devices at the time, but they never really had the full support that a lot of businesses need in terms of, you know, deployment and actually getting hands, getting people's hands on those devices. Um, and in, in terms of getting software support out there either, Apple is a consumer, you know, software, consumer hardware company. Uh, so I think it's a clear sign that they just needed help. And IBM seemed to be a great partner because they needed help too in, in terms of distribution. Now, Mary Bell Lopez, uh, it's easy to announce a partnership like this. Uh, but they're planning some real uh, activities. When do we uh, expect to see some actual products or services coming out of this? Yeah, we're expecting in the fall time frame. I mean, basically, IBM has been working on Apple apps for some time as part of their global business services, and they already have some things in the works. But I think you'll start to see meaningful deployment that leverages the iOS 8 and the 4000 APIs that they opened up starting in the fall time frame. All right, fantastic. Well, Devendra Hardwar is at VentureBeat.com, and you can find him on Twitter at Devendra. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And Maribel Lopez is at LopezResearch.com, and you can find her on Twitter at, surprise, surprise, Maribel Lopez. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech News Today. Thank you. All right. Well, in just a sec, we're going to tell you about some big reversal over at Google. They've changed a big uh, controversial policy at Google+. But first, I want to tell you about personal capital. Personal capital is the place to solve two of the barriers that are keeping you from getting control of your money and growing your wealth. The first is that all your financial information, which is tucked away in 401k accounts and stock, the stock market, bank accounts, all these different sites, which have different usernames and passwords, that's a barrier to understanding what's going on with your money. What personal capital does is they bring all your accounts and assets onto one single screen with visual and intuitive charts and graphs, which you can view on any device. The second barrier to growing your money is you have to pay somebody to manage it, and you're probably paying too much. Uh, personal capital will show you exactly how much you're overpaying for f fees and so on, and tells you exactly how to reduce those fees. So, you know, think about the economics there. If you're smart with your money, this is a service that's free and will immediately save you money and fees right off the bat. That's before you even really get a handle on your finances through their intuitive graphs and charts. Plus, uh, the award-winning app that uh, on Android now supports Android Wear, which is, uh, of course, Google's platform for smartwatches. And this is available in the, in the Google Play Store. Simply download the, uh, the Android version of their app. And if you have a watch, it'll all just seamlessly work together. I've done it. Uh, and, and it's fantastic. Now, uh, Personal Capital also gives you tailored advice on optimizing your investments. Signing up costs nothing, but it pays big dividends. Remember that it's your money. Personal Capital helps you control it helps you understand it, and helps you grow it. And there's also, uh, you know, this this company really cares about you and your well-being, not just not just the financial aspect. Check out their, bl their blog at blog.personalcapital.com. There's a really interesting article there called The Surprising Costs of Your Commute. If you commute to work, you're probably wasting a lot of money in very non-intuitive ways. And this article goes into detail about all the different ways that your commute is costing you a lot of money unnecessarily. And after you're done with this article, you're going to change the way you do your commute. I guarantee it. So that's Personal Capital looking out for you. So to set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. Personal Capital is free, and it's a smart way to grow your money. But you must go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. That's personalcapital.com slash TNT. Well, Google Plus, uh, Sarah Silbert, is uh, a new place now. Uh, they reversed one of their policies. 
Yeah, like you said, this is a pretty big change. Um, now, Google Plus users don't have to use their real name. And if you recall, for the last three years, basically, um, users have had to have their Google Plus profile tied to their actual name. So now, this is actually kind of solving one of the biggest criticisms that privacy advocates have had about Google Plus. Yeah, absolutely. And back in those days, back in the you know the 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 late Pleistocene, otherwise known as about three years ago, both Facebook and Google were both making a huge play to be the identity service so your your Facebook account or your Google Plus account would be like your driver's license or something like that it'd be your online ID and that's why real names are very important if you recall Facebook did a really controversial test back then that asked people to scan pictures of their passports and driver's licenses and upload them to Facebook they got a lot of flack for that and Google Plus said no you must use your real name or you can't use Google Plus and they got a lot of flack for that there was a big push both the social networks were kind of spanked by the public and it was very controversial for a num number of reasons uh, one of the big ones uh, was that professionals often use pseudonyms so let's say for example you know you, you go to the boy genius report right uh he's one of the people we quote often on this show he has a lot of scoops uh he's got an actual name but he wants he would like to have a google plus profile called the boy genius right that's a pseudonym uh google would say no to that kind of thing so that was for professionals authors people writing under uh, pen names and so on, that was a problem. The other one was people at risk, people who are uh, transgender or, you know, they were persecuted in, living in uh, oppressive countries or for whatever reason didn't want to reveal who they were when they were online expressing their opinions. And Google said no to that those people too and said, no, you have to use your real name or you should go elsewhere. The worst part of it is, I think, Sarah Silbert, is they had no way to enforce this. So obviously on Google+, Plus, I mean, there's, there's like 25 Mike Elgins that I know we all know there's only one Mike Elgin. Of Actually, there's, there's two or three in the U.S. that are legit, but not 25. So, you know, so there's no way to enforce it. So it was a dumb rule. They, they made everybody mad for no reason. Right. And also, it wasn't exactly um, cut and dry because page owners and those who had a YouTube um, account, for example, could use other names. So it wasn't just a one rule for everybody. So now everyone's kind of on the same page. Yeah, they are. But it's uh, people are saying what I said yesterday last night on tech news tonight which is it's it's uh, it's too late they should have done this three years ago or something like this i mean there, there's so many solutions it seems to me uh, and and i'm pretty passionate about this because i was like in, in the in the bloody wars uh, arguing about this online for there was like six months where you know this was such a such a big deal uh, and then it became a big deal again when google uh, required youtube users to have a google plus login and log into their google plus account before they could comment on youtube and then Doing that required a real name and so on, ostensibly. Right. Uh, and that was a that brings us to the whole trolling yeah. issue. People are saying, are we going exactly. to have the whole issue of trolls on YouTube again? Not like necessarily having to use your real name necessarily prevented that completely, but um, Googlers are saying that they have a really firm hand on moderating that, so that shouldn't yeah. be an issue. Yeah. We'll see, though. And it's really tragic, in, in my opinion, and I'll tell you why. These very same people who need the protection of pseudonymity, right? Uh, who are harassed or bullied or they're persecuted or whatever, Google Plus is a great place for them to be because the blocking is so easy to do and it's so absolute, very much unlike Twitter. If you look at all the bullying and harassment that you hear about online, it's mostly Twitter but also Facebook. You don't hear about that much on Google Plus because when you block somebody on Google Plus, they are blocked. They're seriously blocked. Plus, it's really easy to to address your, your posts to uh, closed groups of people where they're not open to the public. So... Uh, they could have, they could have been the place for precisely the kind of people that uh, now say that they are not the place for because of this dumb real names policy. So that's, it's a shame. But there you go. If you want to have a, a, a fake name on Google Plus, go for it. It's, an, it's a new place there. Maybe I missed it, um, which is very uh, possible because it's been a busy morning here on Tech News today, and I've had my hands on the controls. But um, if you picked a pseudonym or picked a real name because you had to. Uh, and now you want to revert to a pseudonym. Is that okay, or is this just for new new users? Do um, we know I'm, the answer to that? I'm I don't know for sure. Uh, I did read their announcement. They didn't specify it, that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't feel like I saw that either yeah. because I know a lot of people just did it because they had to. Like Chad Johnson yeah. here, you know, I think he wanted to do OMG Chad, but yeah. couldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, Ron Richards of All About Android wanted Ron So because that's his thing. Ron XO. Um, so if you already picked. You know, hopefully there's at least like maybe like a one time uh, thing to switch over to a pseudonym if you choose. But yeah, I'm planning to change that. my right. name to OMG Mike. So, OK, OMG Mike. Good. 
Okay. I'm sure. I'm sure. Google Chad wasn't very specific about that, but it seems like you can get a limited number of changes. With one of the possibilities maybe being having to wait a month before you can change. Okay. But there's at least some wiggle room there. Okay. Good. All right. Well. Amazon is reportedly testing an all-you-can-read service for the Kindle called Kindle Unlimited. The service would cost $9.99 a month and would provide access to more than 600,000 book titles. Kate Nibbs wrote about the story for Gizmodo and joins us now. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Now, how was this program discovered? I mean, they didn't exactly announce it. No. Um, so, Giga Ohm first reported on it. So, off to them. But um, they were alerted because people were talking about it on the Kindle boards. Uh, Amazon, for whether it was on purpose or an accident, we don't know, but Amazon had um, their Kindle Unlimited pages live for a period of time on its website. And most of them have been pulled. But before they were pulled, people noticed. And you can still access them using a, a Google cache. Kate, so how did Amazon get permission for this from the publishers? Um, well, they don't have permission from the so-called big five, like Simon and Schuster and um, Random House. So they 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 were rumored to be talking to publishers uh, about a month ago. I think Publishing Lunch published a rumor that Amazon was in talks. So they've they've uh, made agreements with like uh, Harvard University Press and. Um, I'm not sure about the other publishing houses they've made agreements with, but they it must have been just behind, behind closed doors talks because nothing has been made public yet. Now, Kate, this is um, this seems to me like a terrible idea for them uh, financially because if you know once this out out there, of course you're going to sign up for this nine ninety nine a month. Uh, if you're a heavy reader, the kind of person who would spend a lot of money on eBooks. Uh, you're likely to get a lot of your ebooks through this program and take a lot of money out of Amazon's pocket. Uh, can you think of any rational reason why this would be a good business uh, decision on their part? Um, honestly, I'm very surprised, partially because I, I don't think it makes that much sense. It's almost like a streaming music service, and those aren't very profitable, really. Um, it also kind of cannibalizes on their Prime service, which already has a lending option, and the, the libraries appear to be slightly different, but they have a lot of overlap. So uh, I am very surprised and a little confused about why they're doing this. Well, it is a test after all, and, and they may fa it may fail the test. <laughs> so this may never see the light of day. We do know that they're looking at it. Uh, Kate Nibbs uh, writes for gizmodo.com, and you can find her on Twitter at Kate Nibbs. Nibbs is spelled K-N-I-B-B-S. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech News today. Thanks. Well, Sarah Silbert, uh, Samsung is uh, is making an interesting move in the world of home automation. Right. Apple has HomeKit, Google has Nest. So now Samsung's looking to catch up to those big players. And according to TechCrunch, it's about to acquire the smart home company SmartThings for about $200 million. To tell us more, we have Steve Kovac, a senior tech editor from Business Insider. Steve, can you start out by telling us exactly how SmartThings would fit into Samsung's goals here? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I've also heard the same thing as TechCrunch. So, I mean, it does sound like this is close to happening. Um, and, you know, Samsung right now, last week, they reported, uh, you know, some dwindling profits because they're having trouble selling um, enough smartphones like in the same volume that they used to. Um, so they're really desperate for a new product category. You know, the smartwatches haven't been really taking off. Um, and so one of the th big trends right now is this Internet of Things trend. And um, this is clearly... Uh, their attempt at buying into it. And uh, SmartThings is a really cool company. I've been covering them um, for at least a year now. And uh, they already have this standard uh, platform ready to go that Samsung could just snap up and start working with. Um, they already have a ton of partners like door lock manufacturers, garage door manufacturers, lighting companies, and so forth. Um, so it would the acquisition would totally make sense for Samsung or some other big company uh, that's trying to compete in that space. But uh, it sounds like Samsung's going to win it. Now, uh, Steve Kovac, um, uh, first, uh, I need to say that SmartThings is a an advertiser on the Twit network, not on this show, but on other Twit shows, mm -hmm. uh, full disclosure there. Um, now, this acquisition, obviously the reason this is a good idea for Samsung, uh, or it seems obvious to me at least, we're definitely heading in the direction of having smartphones be the controlling uh, operator, the remote control for uh, home automation. 
And so Samsung's going to want to be able to offer these this presumably this full complement of services that probably develop apps for this specifically that are much more powerful than the existing apps uh, and, and es essentially have all these home automation products be a kind of um, a smart, you know, a smartphone thing, really. Uh, do you think we're going to see a whole bunch of these kinds of uh, acquisitions to the point where there's so much consolidation that all these little uh, innovative uh, companies that make home automation devices will be owned by one smartphone uh, maker or one smartphone platform or another? Yeah, if you had asked me that question a year ago, I would have said no. But um, as soon as Google bought Nest and started making that, you know, almost a $4 billion bet now because they also bought Jack Pam on Internet of Things, um, it's really putting, pr it's hard for a small startup like Smart Things or anyone else really uh, noodling around with that space to compete. How do you compete against Google's, you know, massive war chest on that kind of thing? Um, so, you know, uh, smart things and maybe companies like it are kind of stuck in this little uh, between a rock and a hard place, really. And they have to, you know, join a bigger company like Samsung or maybe Cisco. I know Cisco is working on this kind of stuff, too, um, if they really want to succeed in it. So um, un unfortunately, right now, it's kind, of, it's kind of hard for like the smaller innovative guys to uh, really compete. Now, do you have a sense of what the, uh, the, the, the deal will look like in terms of the, the cost or in the timing or any other information about the actual agreement itself? Yeah, um, so I spoke to a couple people this morning, uh, some sources I have, and um, as far as cost and stuff, uh, I haven't heard a good price. I mean, TechCrunch is hearing 200 million. That sounds about right. Um, and also, I also heard that SmartThings has been in acquisition talks for a while now, so this isn't like some new breaking thing. Uh, other companies have been sniffing around. And in fact, I spoke to the CEO uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, and he even said like, yeah, there's interest in the company. But at that time I spoke to him, he was saying, you know, if I do get acquired or something, I'm gonna wanna go to a company that's gonna enable us to have this open platform because um, he's a big believer that um, these kind of smart home uh, products need to be uh, open and anyone can build into it. Steve Kovac he writes at businessinsider.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Steve Kovac. Kovac is spelled K-O-V-A-C-H. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech News today. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, a company started accepting pre-orders today for a $499 home robot called Jibo. The company calls it the world's first family robot. It's backed and being created by some of the biggest and most brilliant names in robotics. Let's take a look at their promotional video. These are your things, but these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing oh, Jibo, it's so cute. the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> kind of looks like you did it a little while ago Jibo with one eye. Yeah, throughout their one journey. good eye. He's Not the, the bad it's one. It's like the Pixar <laughs> lamp. It really is. Yeah. It's kind of Wally-like yeah. in a certain way, I guess. And photo. It'll be the last uh, so thing on Earth, probably. <laughs> <laughs> But it doesn't pick up your trash and compact it for you. That's a, that's so, unfortunate. So they're showing a birthday party where the, where the robot is automatically kind of ta following direction from people, voice commands, and taking pictures of people. Now it's interacting with somebody making the, some kind of pastry. She's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. She's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications... Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll. Huh. And the I'll perfect robotic babysitter. Huh. No kidding. Your house in. <laughs> so hey. one of the reasons this is low cost compared to other robotics products, obviously, is that it doesn't walk. It, you plant it on a on a flat surface, and then it's it's sort of like more of a person that doesn't move around. In other words, it talks to you and it does things for you, but it doesn't. It's not the robot in the sense that it goes and gets you a beer, unfortunately. And this kind of feels like a like a, a fake, cheesy like in inside of a movie promotional video yeah. for a robot. Yeah. It doesn't feel real. Uh, it's cool looking. It's it has uh, definitely has a cute factor. Yeah. But if it's just kind of stationary, I don't know. I feel like that kind of limits it a little bit. You have to really kind of think twice about when you want this thing to talk to you as opposed to it just kind of embedding itself in your life, you know yeah. what I mean? So, so here's why I think this is a major, major product other than the fact that um, it actually kind of looks really cool if it works the way it, it, it appears to, to, mm -hmm. to work. 
Uh, it's backed by some of the biggest names in robotics, including uh, Cynthia Breziel, who is the director of personal robotics at MIT Media Lab. Uh, it's uh, backed by Todd Pack, who created several robots for iRobot. Robert Pier Piericini, the uh, team's director of advanced conversational technologies, who's worked at IBM and worked on, on Watson. Uh, Andy Atkins, who's the vice president of engineering, who's worked on both Android and Apple, uh, and has developed streaming platform for Netflix. Uh, the chief cloud architect is Rich Sadowski, who is from Symantec, and so it goes on and on. The people who are building this thing are like the dream team for robotics. So I would be super surprised if they didn't come out with something that was really, really amazing because these these are you know these are incredible people. Uh, so um, you know, and again, at five hundred bucks, it's it's the price of a of a high end smartphone, uh, and um, I don't know. This could be this could be the first home robot that really takes off. I and think. and circular display. That's it's right. the new thing. That's right. Seriously, everybody's going ape over the Moto 360 because of the circular uh, display. And here you go again. Maybe it's a trend. It, it, um, Sarah Silbert, is this the kind of thing that you would be interested in personally buying? Would you? Can you see something like this in your home, like winking at you and taking pictures <laughs> and and, uh, and telling you somebody's like you know sent you a text message? Well. I think the functionality actually seems pretty cool here. But like you said, this isn't something that's just going to like easily fit into your life. It's not going to be part of the background and making your life easier. There's this effort that you have to put in like carrying this around with you. And that's a little odd. That seems like something that's just maybe a little too much effort um, to have to take for this. But um, it's a first step, definitely. I mean, this team is definitely going to come out with more. One of the things that's kind of interesting about it is that the uh, the screen becomes the person's face when you do a video chat with somebody. The, the, their face is taken over by the screen, so that they sort of they become this disembodied uh, person inside the robot when you're chatting with them, and then they go away and it goes back to the regular interface. Um, and just to be clear, this is not a product that is currently in existence. This is being crowd uh, crowdfunded, right? So, um, and and the forty ninety nine price is for people who support the crowdfunding effort. Uh, it's not, you know, they haven't announced a, an eventual retail price for when this thing is available at Best Buy or whatever. Uh, another thing, they, they showed a, a, the robot reading a story to a child. Um, you can upload books to its library and it can read any sort of uh, book. And they hinted that it will actually see content within the book and go and get graphics to go with it as they as they showed. So we'll we'll see how intelligent that part of it is, but I think it's a really interesting development and again this seems like uh, this seems at first blush like it could be nothing, but then you see the people who are behind it and that's the story. These people, you know, head of head of MIT's you know, robotics. I mean, who are you going to get? Uh, yeah, and by the way, uh, per the chat room, Leo just bought one. So, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, you, this, can, you can't stop Leo when it comes to robots. This, this just in. So, yeah, he's a big supporter of crowdfunding. So that, yeah. this, that's great. I think that's a great uh, purchase. I, uh, I I would do that, but I'm, I'm working right now. So, uh, <laughs> well, Sarah, um, uh, let's, let's do uh, the, our next story here. We've got an interesting uh, keyboard for a wearable device, uh, kind of unexpected. Right. A lot of people, when they think of Android Wear, think of using voice commands, voice control. But this company called Minuum has just launched this keyboard app in beta. Um, and there's a video demo that they released as well, um, showing the typing experience on a smartwatch, in this case, the LG G Watch. Uh, so to tell us more about that, we have Stephen Hall, who writes for 9to5 Google and 9to5 Mac. Stephen, can you tell us a little bit more about how this app actually works? Obviously, there's not a ton of re screen real estate on a smartwatch. Yeah, so... Um Minuum itself was it was crowdfunded uh, last year, and it um, the entire point of it basically was to minimize the amount of space on the screen uh, that the keyboard takes up. And Minuum itself, I mean, it's it's, it's an extremely smart uh, keyboard in that it allows you to kind of hit the general area of the key that you want, and it's based on the QWERTY keyboard, but it lets you just hit the general area, and it's so smart that it can. Um, it's it's one of the smartest predicting uh, keyboards, and it can predict what you're typing really well. This is a really interesting company because, of course, they started out as an Android app, and they have a, a way to type really fast on an Android phone. Then they came out with a Google Glass app, essentially a keyboard uh, that you could use with Google Glass, which is kind of surprising. And now they have an Android Wear keyboard 
Um, I, I kind of really like this company. Have you used their Android app or any of the other apps like the Glass app? Uh, yeah, I've used the Android app, and it's. I mean, and I think I think the company also has uh, an iOS app, but it's um, it's more of a demo. And I think, uh, well, they obviously did announce that it's coming to iOS eight because Apple obviously um, has are, are now supporting third party keyboards. But I've tried it out, and it's actually it's really accurate. And I mean, it uses that predictive typing where it, it guess which it guesses which word you want, and you can just tap the word. So even if it's wrong, you can just you're just one tap away from it being right. In a way, this is this is really a contest between two ridiculous behaviors, and you get to take your pick. Uh, for example, uh, you know Jeff Jarvis uh, on uh, uh, this week in Google uh, said that he doesn't use the voice command for his Android Wear uh, watch because he just feels a little goofy, like talking to his wrist in public, and typing on a little tiny screen is a little goofy too. Personally, I don't mind talking to uh, to my watch. Uh, or using voice commands with the Moto X and so on, uh, that sort of thing. But a lot of people do. A lot of people feel very uncomfortable talking. So I, I really think they're onto something here. I think the the impulse for people, if they're going to be replying to a text message or whatever, is to somehow just do it on the screen rather than with their voice. And so I think this uh, this uh, is an interesting technology. Now, do we know when this is going to come out and and exactly um, uh, when people can try it? Uh, well, we kind of do. We, we don't know exactly when it's coming out, but um, on Minuum's blog, they have a form that they're letting people fill out. And if you fill it out, they'll actually send you the latest build of Minuum for, for the LG G Watch and the Samsung Galaxy or the Gear Live. And um, so you can actually try it out right now, as far as I know. Jason, are you tempted by this, uh, this new product? I've signed up. Uh, for the thing, actually, while we've been going, and I've been trying, like, frantically to install it so I can test it out. I'm torn on this, to be honest, because Android Wear, as a kind of extension of Android, and Google has, has gone through gr to great lengths, well, to lengths, anyways, to kind of standardize what they what their vision of Android Wear is, is that it's not an over overcomplicated computer on your wrist, that it's supposed to be a simplified kind of uh, interface uh, for the things that are on your phone. So, you know, you're not going to necessarily use it in the all-encompassing way that you use your smartphone, right? But we're starting to see a lot of developers get in there early because the visibility is so good and create these apps that, uh, you know, are... are questionably uh, useful. Like, like I think what they do is they kind of go outside of what Google thinks, you know, simplicity is good for the platform, and they're just different. They, they kind of take the smartphone paradigm and land it on your wrist. I don't, I'm not sure that's necessarily the best thing. Having said that, though, I love the openness of Android, and that's this is kind of part of that, is that any developer can say, well, you know what? I want to put a keyboard on my wrist, So, and some people are going to want to use a keyboard on their wrist. Uh, I just don't know. You know, it kind of goes counter to what Google's kind of philosophy is on Android Wear. Right. And I think with this, there'll be a very specific use case. People are not going to respond to emails. It's going to be yeah. for very quick text messages. So it's very suited to that one um, in instance. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Hall, one last question. Do we know if this is going to be supported or this is going to, is, is this going to work on the Moto 360, which I uh, expect will be for the time being when it ships the biggest uh, and most popular uh, of the Android Wear watches? Uh, yeah, actually, I don't even actually have an Android Wear watch because I'm waiting for that that little beast of a of, of a piece of technology. But um, actually, uh, Minuum actually uh, they 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 showed a little concept of the of the keyboard running on the Moto 360 before they even made this post about it being um, available for the G Watch and the Gear Live. So yes, they are working on it, and I'm I'm assuming they, well they say they're waiting for. Um, the 360 to actually come out before they um, release any developer build of of it for the round, the round style. Interesting. I, I would think that that form factor, the round form factor, would be especially challenging. Yes. For something like this, because <laughs> you need that bottom real estate, which is cut off on the corners. Stephen Hall writes for 95 Google and also 95 Mac, and you can find him at S T E Q U E U on Twitter. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen Hall. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Well, in, a, in an exclusive, Auto Express editor in chief Steve Fowler revealed that Tesla is planning to unveil a small, smaller electric car called the Tesla Model 3. Steve joins us now to talk about his scoop. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. So, Elon Musk himself revealed this to you, I understand. He did, yes. I met him a few weeks ago and uh, we had the discussion. He's already been on record as saying that uh, he was at a party and somebody said, what are you going to be calling the, the next car? And he wanted to call it Model E so that he could have a Model S 
Model X and a Model E. You can work the rest out for that yourself. Uh, but of course, Ford owns various trademarks. They uh, got a little huffy over that and decided to sue Tesla. So uh, Tesla could no longer use Model E. I asked him what he was going to use. Old as brass, he came out. We're going to call it Model 3 with, uh, with three bars instead of the number three. Steve, so what cars will the Model 3 compete with when it comes to market? Well, really, there are very few all-electric cars in that sort of market. Uh, it's going to be sized similar to a BMW 3 Series, which is the the car that dominates the what we call the compact executive market in Europe. Uh, so the BMW 3 Series and the Mercedes C-Class, also cars like the, the Lexus IS. Um, so it's a really big market. It's a very lucrative market globally, um, and it's a... a huge numbers of those sort of cars are sold. So it could be re a really big move for Tesla. Now, we're a tech show, and so we're interested in the technology here. Is there any new technology in this one that hasn't been seen in other Tesla cars? I'm sure there will be. Unfortunately, I didn't get as far as that. We suspect that the new platform will be uh, the result of uh, another Brit, a fellow Brit, a guy called Chris Porritt. He used to work at Aston Martin. Uh, he now heads up the technical side of, uh, of Tesla. So certainly the chassis, uh, what the car sits on will be uh, uh, British uh, engineered or come from a British engineer. As far as the other tech's concerned, the battery development, we don't know yet. Uh, Elon was claiming a range of around 200 miles, in excess of 200 miles. Uh, so it remains to be seen what sort of battery tech would, of course, expect it to be coming out of the, the new Gigafactory, uh, which will make the batteries a lot cheaper, which will be key to the price, which Elon told me would be around 35,000 US dollars. So that's a good estimate on the price, but do we have any idea of when this will come to market, a timeline? Yeah, yeah. well, we would expect it to be shown at some time in 2016 and probably be on sale by 2017. Uh, the other thing I understand, uh, Elon has a, a habit of letting these things slip, and when he was in the UK, he told us that he was planning to set up a, a UK-based research and development centre. Um, so if it's, uh, if it's here in time, there could be some more UK input into the Tesla Model 3, which would be a great thing in terms of its, its ride and handling, which are real uh, uh, UK-specific engineering inputs. We're, we're very good at developing cars that ride and handle very well. Fantastic. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you guys tend to put the steering wheel on the wrong side, but uh, as long as it's electric and it's a Tesla, uh, I would drive it anyway. Steve Fowler's the editor-in-chief. first. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Steve Fowler's the editor-in-chief of Auto Express, which you can find at autoexpress.co.uk. You can find him on Twitter at Steve Fowler. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech News Today. Been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, in just a sec, we're going to have a follow-up to one of our major stories yesterday. But first, I want to tell you about one of our sponsors today, which is Squarespace. Squarespace. If you get look within when you surf the web, how do you judge websites? You go to a website and you're most likely going to judge it on the elegance of its design and its functionality, how it looks. Does it look cheesy? Does it look like it's from the 90s? Does it look like it was homemade? Or does it look beautiful and elegant like it was uh, created with the best designers in the world? If you create a, a, a website on Squarespace, you're going to impress people with design because they have some of the best design uh, ever uh, anywhere uh, that's uh, been done for graphics. Just go to squarespace.com, click the menu on the right, and then choose templates. I want you to do that right now because you've got to see these for the, yourselves. If you're watching the video, it looks great uh, on screen, but if you look at it directly on the Squarespace site, you'll be impressed. So click menu and then go and choose templates and feast your eyes on templates like Aviator, Front Row, Pacific. They all have names. Adirondack is one of my favorites. And then each one of them will show you examples, uh, real-world examples, that actual users have done with those. And, of course, they all look pretty different. They all have that same elegant design, but they've been customized because that's what you can do with a Squarespace uh, site. And these templates radiate amazing designs, and they're created with the best browsers in mind and the best uh, phones and tablets in mind. But they'll work on any device, even, even older devices and so on. And, and websites created with Squarespace will always recreate themselves for the size and the type of device that the person is using to look at it. It takes just a few minutes to create a beautiful website, literally just a couple of minutes. Uh, I've created many websites on Squarespace and it's just, it's fun to do. That's how easy it is to use. So uh, you can uh, start a free two week trial with no credit card required. And here's a, here's a tip for you if you're a blogger who's blogging on another platform. 
you can simply import your existing blog from WordPress, Blogger, Tumblr, or other uh, blog platforms just right into your Squ new Squarespace blog. So if you, you don't have to feel trapped in those other platforms. You can create your own Squarespace with your own domain and have total control over it on Squarespace, and it's easy to do because you can import it. And, of course, a mobile blog app uh, helps you make text updates, and you can tap and drag images to change the layouts. You can monitor comments on the go, and that's all provided by Squarespace. If you have any questions, chat and email support is available 24-7. And it starts at just $8 a month. And that includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. So here's what we'd like you to do. To start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and to start building your website, just sign up for Squarespace. Make sure you use the offer code TNT and that'll get you 10% off. And it'll also show your support for Tech News Today. And we thank Squarespace for their support of this show. We opened this show yesterday with how to tell the FCC your opinion on net neutrality. It was the last day of their public comment period on the proposal by FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. But as we reported, the site was hammered by traffic and you really couldn't get into the site. Because of that, the FCC has extended the comment period until Friday, so it's still not too late for your voice to be heard. And in other news, Apple's iPhone 6 is still months away at least but a clone of the phone has already been announced. A Chinese copycat phone maker called GooPhone announced their GooPhone i6, very creative title, uh, with an August ship date. The phone is apparently based entirely on leaks and rumors. The company also beat Apple to market with their knockoff versions of the Apple iPhone 5 and 5S phones, which ran Android. Uh, Jason, you're an Android fan. Uh, does this look like the kind of Android phone you want? Uh, not necessarily. I've heard of Goo Phone before. But I've never actually seen one in the flesh, but I've seen plenty of knockoff, like, uh, you know, clones of other phones that are running Android. And I can't tell you of any of those times that I've seen those that I was very impressed with uh, the actual, you know, guts, the guts of the phone versus yeah. just the looks. And even the looks. You know, it's surface. If it's surface value, you don't want to judge this phone by the looks. You want you want to know that it's that it's got some intelligence inside. And I'm not entirely sure that this one does. <laughs> well, and it probably doesn't have sapphire outside either. No, so. definitely not sapphire. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the tech news today. Sarah Silbert, thank you so much for joining us every Wednesday. Where can people thank read you. your stuff? They can read me at Engadget, and I'm also on Twitter at Sarah Silbert. All right. So follow Sarah Silbert on Twitter. Thank you so much. We'll see you next Wednesday. Take care. Well, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS, and many other places. Just choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. And please follow us on Twitter. Tech News Today TV is our Twitter name. And please send us your thoughts and opinions. You can leave voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. We listen to every single voicemail. And also, don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight. Jason is doing it tonight. Yeah, right here on the Twit Network. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.